speaking. So I apologize if this seems a little incomplete. Um, but I, what I will do is I'll try to, you know, using some words and encouragement, try to cover and uh, make sure that I recognize the way that's done something really interesting this year. Um, it's been a real privilege to be the department chair over the last, well, since 2007, so now it's appointed. And um, last year I had mentioned that a number of interesting things were going to happen, we're going to think about how things are going. And I would compare this past year more to a monsoon or a flood of things happening, literally in terms of water and pipes breaking, but also of good things, really, really, really good things. A flood of students coming in, a flood of you know, Newton. student credit hours are about thirty percent over the previous year, and we're larger than that again this year. Goodness, what it appears to be from the first uh, enrollment rolls. Heidi, uh, Heidi Frank, our admin assistant. The graduate students don't know that um, Heidi's here, right? Yes. Yeah. There you are. She's the she's the admin assistant. So if, if a graduate student wants to find me, go talk to her first. <laughs> she'll she'll be able to find me usually, and she usually can answer most of the questions. But She'll answer the hard ones. I'll take the ones that, that, that aren't so hard. Um, but, um, you know, there, there, there's, there are just a, a, a large number of things that happened. Um, Heidi told me that um, the number of uh, the courses all the way up to almost the 5,000 level, there were no space in almost any course. 3,000, 4,000 level courses were completely booked the first time this has happened. And we probably could have added another section of each of the 2,000 level courses. We don't have physical space to actually do it. We even had people that could possibly teach it. We just didn't have physical space to do it. And that's a real problem, because there's a, there's a real desire to get that knowledge of physics. It's a basic, it's a basic core of engineering. And you know, we're, what we're reflecting is a strong interest, both regionally and nationally, in engineering. People are interested in actually doing something with a degree that they can physically make something or design something and they're interested in their job, as well as uh, doing something that's just scientific and interesting. We have uh, many, many interesting breakthroughs going on in science now. The Higgs boson discovery, quote unquote, I guess we can call it a discovery now. And uh, that was followed around the world. The Mars lander thing was just incredible, watching Curiosity land. I remember being in Tucson with my sons. I had just been up here to the Denkers event. The night before, the star party at Steve Decker's house, one of our donors, and uh, we had a number of education public outreach things. I flew down to Tucson so I could go to work the next day. And I stayed up that night, and um, NASA had this wonderful web page with both the position of the satellite as it was starting to get close to Mars, uh, the lander, and also the velocity. So I had my kids plot position versus velocity and record it to a spreadsheet and watch it. It weren't like one over R, which it actually did. And it was just fun, just you know, inventing things like that for people. People to do that. There's so much information out there, and so much uh, interest in that project. Um, back here at the university, Kathy Bueller and a number of the faculty members ran a uh, up at the engineering building, an open uh, an open house for both uh, the lander as well as watching the video, and it was a big success. A lot of people from the community showed up. So I think that there's just this real, this strong need and interest in science and engineering and math fields. And we have to do something to accommodate that. And that's what's gonna, that's what's gonna help our state out to, in terms of growing business. It's gonna help people to appreciate the world. And it's gonna get us out of politicians saying crazy things which have no basis in science. People will be able to call them that for that and say that, no, this is, this is the truth people will vote and people will know what the reality is behind it. A number of the very key issues that, that are going on regionally and nationally. Okay, so um, I thought I would just give a brief summary before I went into the whole talk. And so you'll see this at the end. But this is where we're at. We have a record growth in student enrollment. I mentioned that already. Um, we've had excellent success in attracting new faculty as well. We've been recruiting some of the best people in the country. We've actually gotten them here and uh, provided them resources. And that's continuing to go. I mean, it's, we've got this really strong support from every administration, and we'll be thankful both to Dean uh, Pierre Sikorsky, who's here, one of our faculty members, and also to uh, Senior Vice President Mike Hard Hardin, and also uh, President Purdy, who was the, uh, the previous Senior Vice President for faculty. They both have been really strong supporters of uh, 
of the growth of the physics department. Um, we've received a number of major research awards um, that indicate exceptional depth and uh, strength in our department. And uh, that, that's, that's kudos to everybody that's worked on it. Many of these things are larger projects, but the individual ones which have been outstanding as well. Um, we've had this phenomenal growth in interest and also this uh, participation in education and public outreach. We had to add a new staff member just to handle that. And probably could add another one as well if we had the funds to do it. And it probably still wouldn't exhaust the, uh, the, the amount of stuff that we can do there. The interest is tremendous. Um, on the bad side, we have worn facilities, but they're getting some long overdue repairs and upgrades. If you look at this room here, it's a lot brighter than it was a year ago. You don't have asbestos hanging over your heads. You've got new tiles. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other rooms are as well. We had to close down the rotunda over the entire summer to make this happen. But on the other hand, there are some really great benefits that came out of this. Hopefully, the, uh, the, the water pipe situation, which has been playing this for the past few years, would be on that. We'll put a new piping for the entire rotunda, and then we'll be on the rest of the building now. Um, we have been able to hire a, a small number of staff members to help out with the exceptional growth. And I wish we could do more, but we're limited by our budget more than anything else. If we, the, the, step, the budget that we have for staff is really tied to this SCH. And so if we can continue to grow the SCH, we could increase the staff and service that growth. Of course, the biggest problem is we don't have any place to put it. So the, the thing that's really stopping us is the, the physical space and the need for more meeting space for the uh, for the classes and for the for the faculty, better quality meeting space. We see increased donor support and donor interest, and that's been a great thing. Um, but like I said, I think we've outgrown our physical space, and we're we're looking now seriously at new additions, and have been having discussions with the uh, the dean's office as well as the other administration about that. And I think I'll show a couple pictures, which you're not supposed to show, but I'm going to show them anyway, just because I think they're kind of. They're, they don't represent reality, but they sort of represent some uh, some concepts that the that the architects came up with after about a six month study as to what would be possible. Okay, so let's start out with faculty and staff. Uh, right now, we have 38 tenure track faculty, and some of the changes in the next in this past year, Professor Oleg Stark was promoted to a full professor, and that was. Um, long overdue, you know, he's one of our most exceptional condensed matter theorists and a fantastic person. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a great asset to the department, both for the graduates and the undergraduate students as well. Dan Maddox was uh, promoted to uh, emeritus faculty and he, uh, he officially retired this past year, but I'm sure we'll still see him around. We're going to be trying to organize a little event for him sometime in the fall, a little uh, reception for him and some of his friends. Um, we hired um, two new tenure track faculty members. Uh, Dima Pesson, I believe he's here. There he is. So he, he came from UT Austin, and he's, uh, he's joined the Condensed Matter Theory Group. And uh, Professor Vikram Deshpande, who's from Columbia University, New York, will be joining us in, uh, in January. He works, on, uh, he works on Condensed Matter Experiment. Um, we also had some non tenure track appointments, some uh, uh, lecture staff. Tabitha Beeler, as I mentioned, she came, she did a little bit of work with us in the fall, but she was officially appointed as of January this year. They've been doing an amazing job. That Tabitha's right there. And uh, doing an amazing job of teaching classes as well as taking over the, uh, the ownership of the South Physics Observatory and setting up a, a regular program for the use of that facility um, for students. and. Uh, for the for public outreach. Um, uh, Andy Smith is a, somebody that joined my group. He's a research assistant professor. And uh, he's, he came from Argonne National Labs. And uh, he was also doing a lot of teaching as well in the evenings, picking up this third course of the, uh, of the engineering physics course in both, in both semesters. We do have a search for a tenure track condensed matter experiment to prove this year. And so uh, they've already placed the ads and being on the search. Uh, Valley Gardini is the chair of that. So if anyone wants to apply, go, go talk to Valley. Maybe you, you can put them on that in line. I've heard that there are there may be some previous graduates of the University of Utah who've gone off to very illustrious careers that may be interested in applying back again. There's some inquiries that some of our own may be interested in coming back. That was kind of being 
Um, and then there's also this Materials Research Center, the Mersex Center, which was, I had mentioned it last year, and uh, that's a $12 million NSF funded and about $8 million from the university. Um, um, uh, cooperation between engineering and science to develop new types of materials, and it has two focuses, one on photonic materials and the other on spintonic phenomena. And there are two hires associated with that. I believe one of those is going forward. If not, well, they have set up a search committee, and um, so they will be advertising. And there's a potential that there could be a hire that, that comes to physics. Um, so we'll see. There are two staff changes this year. Um, so D uh, Dina Young, um, she's here. Oh, up in the back. She joined us last fall in accounting. Um, she replaced Jolene Snyder, who went up to the, uh, the main purchasing office. And uh, Dr. Z. Hen Wu, he is joining us on September 1st, I believe. He, he take, comes from uh, Cooley City University in New York. Um, and he's essentially taking over Randy Polson's new Randy Polson is still going to be affiliated with the department, but he's moving up to the new microscopy core up in the U Star building. So uh, he'll be working with Matt DeLong and maintaining the imaging facility as well as developing new instrumentation for the solid state group. In terms of the uh, budget, NSCH, I mentioned that uh, last academic year we were up about 30%, and uh, that substantially helped out our department budget. You can see, um, we see roughly how the thing's been growing over the past couple of years. So in 2010 2011, the, this is the salary of all the faculty members and graduate students and staff. It doesn't involve research, it just involves the, uh, the, the non research part of the department. Productivity means how many student credit hours you have, and there's an additional, if you have additional student credit hours, you get a little bit of extra money. So we, uh, we have 4.21 million in salaries for everyone in operations, and about 145 in productivity. Uh, last year, uh, at the end of, or last of, at the July 2011, it was 4.29, 189K. And then our base budget, which was set just a few months ago, July 1st, it's 4.58. So you see the steady growth in the, in, in, the, in the support of the department, plus the productivity on the up this past year due to the student credit hour support. So those are all, all good things. Um, some of the places where it's been offset, um, we don't get to squirrel that money away really. Uh, we've used a lot of this money to help out with the TA and RA salaries for the uh, graduate students to bring them up to national averages. And so that's, that's one of the places where um, a good fraction of this money went to. We also were allowed to hire new staff on productivity funds. Now usually, there, there are two types of money that the state gives us, one called above the line and one called below the line. The above the line is reoccurring money every year. It's sort of called hardened money, and it's guaranteed you're going to get it every year. And so they allow people to, to hire on that because you're going to hire somebody for a long time, five or 10 or 15 years. The stuff below the line is sort of reoccurring money year by year, and they worry a little bit about predictability. They became comfortable enough with it about a year ago that the, that the SCH was going to remain high that they allowed us to start um, hiring permanent people on the SCH money. And so uh, that's allowed us to increase our staff a little bit to, to help out with some of this growth in the department. So uh, that's, that's a good thing. We just have to be careful. We don't try to use up all the SCH money for that. You have to be prudent and uh, use some fraction of it in case it decreases a little bit in the future. But you want to, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice thing to be able to have that flexibility and, uh, and use the department funds to do something long term rather than uh, having to try to spend it each year. So. Um, this was just a little thing I, I was, gave another talk else. I just grabbed this slide and I was pointing out some of the, uh, this was actually from, from the Apples Foundation. I had this slide. So this is where we were back in 2007 when I first uh, became chair. I had 27 faculty members. We're at 38 now. Uh, 210 majors back then, about 280. So growing, this is undergraduate majors. Might even be more than that now. I don't know. Lynn told me 275 yesterday, but I may not be mystic here. Our SCH here, this was just a, that was what we had last year, grew quite a bit since 2007. These are some of the projects that I highlighted the uh, Eccles Foundation, the Versac, which I discussed already. I'm working down in on, uh, northern Arizona with a number of people in Europe about a new array called the Shirkoff Telescope Array. This is sort of a square kilometer. 120, 150 million dollar array of telescopes to do high energy camera astronomy. 
a number of our faculty members in astronomy are working on this big boss project. And this is a uh, project to look at very distant active galactic nuclei, I look at the light from them, and look at the, um, the line in alpha forest, in other words, the absorption lines from gas that comes from the light coming from a very large distance going through the column depth of the integrated gas between the source and us. And by doing that, and by looking at the rate shift of those individual lines, you can even start where the gas is and get a three-dimensional picture of where the gas is and where the matter is in the universe. By doing that, you can not only extract some information about the dark energy, but even things like heavy neutrinos and some particle physics properties. The reason I put this in here was a week ago, um, this, this past uh, year, they have been, the National Academy of Sciences and National Science Foundation was re-ranking all astronomy projects in the country because federal budgets for astronomy are sort of flat and they want to start new projects and they had to decide which projects could move forward and which ones might be sunset in the near future and this one came out with a really really good ranking it looks like it's going to move forward um, fairly quickly now usually if they don't have money they'll stone you off but there's a lot of discussion about pushing this forward as fast as possible so it was Really, really need to see something like this at the University of Utah. Leadership on that is, is Adam Bolton and uh, Carl Doss have been the main leads in the Big Boss collaboration. In terms of graduate students, uh, Jackie sent me this little slide. Uh, 93 graduate students, 92 in their PhD and one Master's of Science right now. Nine domestic students were just admitted. A uh, number from Utah, Portland, UVU, Wisconsin, Weber had seven international students. Uh, so we welcome all the students. I hope that the first week has gone well for you, and I hope you're finding the University of Utah to be a warm place and uh, with lots of interesting opportunities for you. Uh, graduation last year, 31 bachelors, 7 masters, 17 PhDs. That's about sort of the average of what we did previously. So this will probably creep up as our enrollment continues to creep. Okay, so in terms of facilities, there's been a lot of changes here, and it's actually been rather exhausting since the last year. Um, we started out with renovations at the library. We got some uh, capital facilities money for it back about the beginning of 2011, and uh, there were several delays associated with getting that project going. <laughs> And so that was, that was completed around October, and that's a nice new space for the graduate students to meet, as well as uh, getting rid of all the books which had dusty things on them and nobody was actually using them very much. People are using the, the online facilities now, we just got new computers in that room as well. There's a, I think I have a little picture of what that looks like. So this is on the second floor of JFB. These computers were just replaced with new uh, single screen computers, because they're very nice. I, I encourage graduate students and undergraduates to use this space. It's a great meeting space and a uh, place to hang out um, and do homework and things like that. That's what it was intended for, it's an interaction space. It wasn't meant to be a, you're allowed to talk in this library. It's no problem at all. Um, Rotunda Lecture Hall was just repiped during the summer of 2012, and uh, I believe we're 100% complete on that now. I don't know uh, where Harold went, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much left was left on it, but I think they're pretty close. Yeah. And so now they're working on the main building, and they'll be calling for the pipes from time to time. And they kicked me out of my office last week, I just got back in. There's a steam upgrade of all the facilities. Uh, they started back in October of last year with digging a trench around the physics department, and so that it was impossible to actually get here without going through some kind of a moat. Which I, I blamed on chemistry. I thought they actually they were trying to, uh, to isolate us from the rest of the department. But six months later, they're actually, they're, right now, they're surrounded by a moat now. And so we've returned the, uh, the favor to them. We thought that they were done about April or May, but apparently they still had uh, problems with the system. And so they've been, at least they haven't torn up our driveway yet, but they're, they're putting new uh, valves in and things like that. And that's, that's what the activity is going out here um, underneath the breezeway right now. They're still working on it. And then the steam operate things. Uh, we did get funding in May uh, uh, for the CF and Army's uh, facilities and renovations for um, a fourth floor astronomy room. It actually will be a lecture hall and public outreach area to be used both with the Frisco Peak Observatory 
and also for if it's raining out, people can show movies and things like that. It's just underneath the uh, underneath the existing telescopes, and so that will probably this will probably start uh, probably finish by the end of next summer. I guess. It's starting on the planning process, and a number of people. Uh, this is a Neil Seth's project, and, it's, uh, and a number of other people in astronomy. Neil Seth is the faculty member that led that, and. Um, they, they are committed together to take out the best use of the space in the money. It's about hundred thousand dollars worth of renovation there. I mentioned that we had an architectural study for a new building addition, and I'll show you a picture of that. And one last facility, which was a really nice coup, was something else. Harold Simpson, who's in charge of the department, got it's he got this new Hermley C thirty U CNC machine center, which would take up a good fraction of this room if we brought it in here. Uh, it's about eight hundred thousand, nine hundred thousand dollar. Milling, milling machine, machining center, and it's actually better than anything that exists even in industry in the state of Utah. It's bigger than the one they have at Boeing and also at McDonald Love. So it uh, so really does a nice, uh, nice machine that can do some amazing uh, things. And we were able to get that with uh, some help from the other administration, from President Pershing, and also some cooperation from engineering. So um, it was it was nice to see all the different groups working together to keep this facility on campus. Not, not lose that because it's going to be a great facility for, for our work. Got to do that. Here's the construction going on. They covered up, this is what this room looked like a couple months ago. They covered the whole ceiling up there, just tore down all, this, all the uh, all the tiling and then had to take it out with the asbestos of pavement. Okay, in terms of funding, I had previously mentioned this MERSEC Center was funded. That's, that was led by faculty members of Valley Levine, Chris Abroma, Brian Sam. Uh, John Lupton, also uh, Sean P. Nudge, uh, uh, George Hurt, a number of other faculty members also, Clinton Williams also <coughs> participated in this in a joint effort with people in chemistry and also people in material science and electrical engineering. And uh, that's a five-year center. There's both graduate assistantships available there, as well as undergraduate research projects available in the MERSEC Center. Uh, we just got a $100,000 Echoes grant from when uh, Neil Seth and Carol Dawson led this. The Education and Public Outreach in South Physics, and also the must be a W in here, the Willard Apples Observatory, which is at 10,000 feet in Southern Utah, and so uh, that's that was given to us by the, the Apples Foundation and Steve Dankers, who's a good friend of our department. Um, a really nice uh, award came when I got this about a month ago. Was a one million dollar telescope or radar project called Tara, it's led by um, John Belts in the Cosmic Gray Group. And uh, the reason why this is special, the, the University of Utah used to have a relationship with the Keck Foundation many, many years ago, going back in the 1970s. And then for various reasons, the, the relationship broke off and there hadn't been any awards in many years, about 25 to 30 years. So this is the first award that, that was uh, given to the University of Utah in a long time. So it's very important for the upper administration and for future, future awards at the University of Utah in physics for the chemistry, biology, and other sciences. So um, it's nice to see the ground broken again and establish that relationship, and that's going to be it's going to be great to see that project move forward. John's received also MRI R2 funding the previous year, major research instrumentation funding for this NSF funding for this project, and it looks like it's going to be a really interesting you know, new technique if it actually pans out. Many base grant renewals. People have uh, base grants which support their graduate students and travel and postdocs. I myself got mine renewed about a month and a half ago, which was very nice. So we have funding for both Veritas and the Hawk Experiment, um, Hawk Observatory in, uh, in Mexico. And I know uh, Cotton Ray has ongoing funding in a number of the solid state groups have gotten recent funding. Um, space telescope grants, we have a number of those, a number of guest investigator grants at NASA as well. When you add it all up, uh, the fiscal year ended in July, uh, our June 31st, 2012. 6.5 million external funding. Our five-year average was 5.9 million. So we're doing above average, that's good. And this, I actually think we're doing better than this because 2008 was a very exceptional year. That was a year that they had uh, stimulus funding and the department had $9 million, 9.5 million. So this 5.9 million dollars includes a $9 million spike. The average is actually a little bit lower than that, probably about 4.8 or 4.9. So in fact, we're, we're doing substantially better than the five that we're here. We're definitely on the upswing here. Okay, um, for the graduate students, just a 
list a few of the research areas that we have here in the department. I thought I'd just show a couple of highlights here. Now, I asked people to send me slides, and I had downloaded them to this new thing called Google Drive. And Google Drive apparently has very many problems. <laughs> <laughs> I put in about 50 slides in, and then I went to go look for them last night, and there were only about 10 of them that were readable. So, <laughs> I apologize if things are missing. It doesn't mean that your research isn't good. It means that Google doesn't like you. <laughs> um, but uh, we've got some amazing research going on in all, all of these fields and major awards, uh, nationally recognized awards in each of these different fields. And I'm not going to be able to go through each of, each of these things, but I wanted to mention a couple of these ones that I thought were just fantastic, which also got a lot of press coverage. Um, this was um, a spintronic, spintronic group, which is, um, which is um, Christoph Barmer's group. And one of, the, one of the interesting things he looked at was weekly spin over coupled materials. And uh, there was a press release about um, new magnetic materials, uh, new magnetic sensors associated with, for the first time, using a spintronic effect. This is a new type of uh, material that you paint on. It's very, very inexpensive. You can make a really active magnetic field sensor, which I believe is close to a hall sensor. It's not too far off of it. But really, really dirty. Christoph. Is Christoph. Is he not here? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. You want to say a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, okay, I can. Um, so, what's really interesting about this is it's dirt cheap, as you, as you mentioned, as you can actually. I don't want to say spit an organic semiconductor on a glass surface, but it. It's like a fraction of a cent at which you could do it if you did it industrial on an industrial base. And the good thing is if you compare it, for instance, to Hall Center, which is also not a very expensive device, it's actually very accurate as an absolute measurement. Because what you use is you use electrons, which are weakly spin orbital coupled. So they're almost like vacuum electrons. And you use a gyromagnetic ratio, which is basically a constant of nature, as the magnetic field standard. And that's a trick, basically. You read this with electric current, so you have a small device. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it was neat because I, I, I saw some press releases that came out in Silicon Valley, and people were interested in it in, in Silicon Valley as well. And so the, the, I, I actually had seen uh, President Pershing at an event about, about a week ago, and I was telling him about this. Right. Said, and he said, I hope you patent this thing. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, we patented uh, three years before we yeah. wrote the paper. Uh, yeah. Because um, you know, we published a lot of stuff, and there's always interest from press and all this. But this one's different, because this is um, not really basic research, but applied research. You can essentially, if you ask me what's the obstacle or whatever, then um, right now we're trying to make it small, to make it more interesting. And beyond that, it's an engineering project, basically, to build some neat without electronics or something like that. Yeah. It was great, great public, public relations and public press for the physics department in the stadium and in the general public. So you know, that's, that, that's great work that's going on. This is one of the first research, uh, research efforts that you know, associated with the MERSEC Center as well. I mean, it started obviously before the MERSEC Center, but the name of this project and this press release had the MERSEC Net name on it, and it was everywhere. And again, that's, that really helps out the, the, the visibility of the MERSEC Center, and then looking forward to a future renewal in a few years from now, putting the case together for that. Um, this is another one which also had a tremendous amount of uh, press, which was this organic, spin organic light emitting diodes. But this is based upon spintronic effects, not just the normal organic light emitting diodes. So, Valium There it is. So, uh, so Valium's group led, led this one, and uh, I don't know if you want to say a, a minute or so about it, but again, this had a huge press release around the country, around the world. It was just fantastic. Yeah, in the field of organic light emitting diodes, um, there's no possibility of controlling the electron emissions of the magnetic field, and uh, we prove that uh, we can control the electroluminescence and probably later on also the color by electron on the electric field. And uh, if this happens, then uh, uh, it's a new technology because now external magnetic field can control colors. But uh, there is like uh, no technology in TV monitor. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's completely new technology. And uh, I've got all kinds of uh, interest from industries. And, uh, 
However, um, it dies at about 200k, and um, we have to walk in order to do it at one time. Okay, so that's why that's the reason why this room is so cold right now. <laughs> 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 okay, well, now and again, this is this is uh, this is associated with the. Uh, the, the IRG, the next generation materials for plasmonics and organic spintronics in that MRSEP center. And so that's, that's great. The, uh, the, the, the spintronic materials has led the, the head of that independent research group the, is Brian Song. And so he's got two titles in this cap already um, that he can. Uh, this, was, uh, this one's actually on the National Science Foundation webpage the day that it showed up. So that was, that was fantastic. Okay, there are, there are a couple other. Pictures that I'll show here of some of the things going on. Uh, Clayton Williams has been looking at um, surface states in materials and using tunneling measurements to find defects, single trap states here. Just a little picture by this. We've been working with Valley on some organic cell materials as well. So this is a, a diagnostic thing, but he's got a number of graduate students working on this. I don't know Clayton wants to say something. Let me click her. You want to go to the next slide? Is that, that one? Uh, I think maybe of most interest, uh, we have a new uh, low temperature AFM which uh, allows us to uh, image the, what you see on the left hand side is an uh, image of the silicon surface, it's called the 7 by 7 reconstruction. And uh, we have really a beautiful facility now to uh, <coughs> even at low temperatures at atomic scale phenomena. Uh, we'll be looking at molecules there, looking at phosphorus uh, atoms and, and a whole range of some spin, see the spin kind of measurements on the time scale. Great, thanks. Uh, this is a slide that Jordan Dirk had sent to me talking about the detection of magnetic impurities. I don't know if Jordan wants to say something really quick about this guy. I think uh, Andre better say something about that. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that's our slide basically paralyzed kind of color work we work with our power group and group of the children here. Objective here was for studies is going to handle the question of what is going on this superconductivity when the size of the system goes uh, very small. And uh, we use our magnetic probe actually to magnetic impurities to probe this state. And I think uh, from points of physics, the most interesting work is this is low one. Basically, we discovered that for certain types of, 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 of superconducting fields adding magnetic impurities does not do really any So that's really kind of very unusual. Right? And uh, we, we, we were puzzled with this question, and I think that this on phenomenological level, the answer came from the look at the morphology of the field. And what we see is that if you look at morphology of the fields uh, that behave uh, normally and behave and display this anomalous behavior, they actually quite different. And we check this. Uh, German and we use this beautiful tool and then this atomic force microscope equipped with this carbon nanotech that is used as a teeth, which really allows us to see the morphology of these two kind of fields and we believe that is actually what causes all this uh, anomalous behavior. Thank you. Okay, um, Shanti Zimyad has been working on high pressure physics. Uh, Shanti, do you want to say something really quick? Um, yeah, well, uh, here are some of the stuff that has been done in the past year, you know, group, the, uh, the work that is completed, the melting line of uh, lithium that we found, those are the, the graph on the right, so it's colored uh, lines are showing the melting line up to 70 GPA, which is 700,000 uh, kilopar, uh, sorry, 700,000 atmospheric pressure about, and uh, we find that the transition temperature drops dramatically down to below about, about the room temperature. At really high pressure, it's one of the lowest melting temperature of any material. We found a very novel method to do this that no one has been used it to understand the meltings under pressure because these are very difficult experiments. So that's one work. There are other works also that will graph on the right side is the superconducting transition of the rubidium iron selenide. Is it, re-entrant superconducting uh, phase that has been recently observed and in a similar class of material, this iron nickel are very uh, interesting and this iron selenide is a closely related to the iron nickel and um, we see that re-entrance under pressure. 
We also are working with MARSEC, but that high pressure infiltration of photonic crystals has been done. And in our group, um, there are other um, projects uh, on, uh, related to the virology and uh, also uh, finding new material, new, new superconducting materials that you're doing in collaboration with other groups. Thank you. Um, this is some work that was done with uh, by uh, by Solis, I believe. And he was looking at how how uh, viruses go across cells and how they actually how DNA deploys itself. And this is actually very fascinating. Solis can do a better job of explaining than I can. Go ahead. So, so this has been a, a really fun year. Uh, the virus just seems that looks like it would. Uh, in 85, uh, this virus needs uh, something called a polymerase in order to replicate itself. That's the green blob you see packaged on the, on the right. In 1985, Don Summers at the University of Utah opened up this virus and showed that this polymerase was all over the mm -hmm. genome. That established the position of the polymerase for the whole negative sense of many viruses to be random. These include RSV, rabies, a lot of pathogenic viruses. In collaboration with Jordan Gettin's lab and Eric Jorgensen's lab in high resolution region, we were able to show that this polymerase actually packages very carefully near where it should be when it enters the whole cell to be the most potent, and that you see at the blue thing at the back of the virus. That's where it needs to be close to its promoter. And we now have ob observation by high resolution by and kind of proving that it's there. And uh, it kind of opens the door for looking at a lot of other pathogenic viruses and seeing uh, what, what the polymerase does there. And we also have had observations on HIV that we see steps on uh, formation. I want to acknowledge all of the wonderful people who work with here, the you, and also our company. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a picture that Bernard Gelman sent me. He's been working on antioxidants and living human tissue. He's using this Ronin spectroscopy technique, applying to a very uh, a number of different uh, th things, both in retina and also skin. And in fact, they just had a uh, new patent that came out associated with this. And um, this is going to it's been a, a fairly uh, fairly big big connection to the medical school, both the the Moran Eye Center, with uh, Paul Bruce and the Moran Eye Center. Which I move a little quicker here than some of these things. Uh, Carl Pintar sent along a picture of a gigantic computer that he's working on. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is his new INCC office anymore. No, <laughs> he's been working on a lot of QCD and he's going to say a couple words about the progress that's been made in the last year. Yeah, well, this is just looking at charbonium, which is the uh, high energy equivalent of positronium. And it's an interesting laboratory because people try to calculate the same. The levels are very well known experimentally. And it's a challenge, theoretically, to calculate the splitting. And so this is just showing progress in our ability to do this. It's the plot of the splittings versus the lattice spacing. And what we want to do is take the lattice spacing to zero to reach reality. And so those curves show the extrapolation to zero. And we want to compare the blue square with the magenta and cyan bursts. It corresponds to two different experimental measurements of this splitting. And you see that we're doing a pretty good job here. Uh, and what's happened over the past three years with all this big computing power is we've been able to reduce the errors to plus or minus 3 MeV, which is quite a, quite a feat <coughs> in physics to be able to do that kind of calculation. So we got five people in the group that I listed on the previous page, and we're having fun with this kind of thing. Okay. Um, this is just a picture that Charlie sent to me about the uh, telescope right of John Adams, I believe, and they have an electron light source that they can excite the atmosphere and use it as a calibration source for simulated air showers for telescope array. Telescope array is the largest cosmic ray detector in the northern hemisphere and looks for the origin of the, the highest energy cosmic rays of all. And if the uncertain origin is, is, is there are some that should not exist. They, they're too high of an energy and they shouldn't exist. Um, if they came from extra galactic sources. So this is one of the things that they're looking at is they're showing that this is the only experiment, I think, this is the first experiment that had an electron source of this Japanese company. It puts a, a beam of electrons into the air and simulates the shower. 
Uh, it's about uh, 120 miles south of Salt Lake City. Okay. And then they have this telescope ray uh, extension, which they're trying to go to a lower energy tier. You know, if somebody from the cosmic ray wants to say this briefly, maybe Gordon, can you say something really briefly about TAIL? Well, uh, up until a few years ago, the main um, focus of cosmic ray research was to find a very high energy feature in the spectrum called the GZK cutoff. And in doing so, people jumped over a whole bunch of interesting energy uh, ranges um, that the low energy extension of the telescope array is now zeroing in on. For example, the transition between cosmic rays of galactic origin and cosmic rays of extragalactic origin uh, is, is in this range that we're going to be looking at uh, with the with tail telescope ray low energy extension. Um, this is a this is a slide that I think I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to describe everything on here. This slide that is instantly along with vision. But I didn't want to I didn't want to thank Ines. I, uh, I don't think she's going to be able to describe everything, but she's been looking at the origin of nu nuclei, um, the nucleosynthesis in the galaxy, and where the stars they they origin, and and uh, looking at differences between stars that are close to the galactic uh, plane and ones that are further away at higher galactic latitudes. Uh, the one thing I would like to mention is the fact that she's got a lot of undergraduates and graduate students that are working on this project. She's been very, very prolific in getting graduate students and undergraduates involved. And if I can say one highlight on that slide is Dan Filler's work. He's on his way back right now from an undergraduate summer fellowship at Caltech. But for the work that he did on the Blobular Cluster, he's found the largest oxygen sodium anticorrelation observed in any Blobular Cluster and won the National uh, Astronomical Society's highest award from the American Astronomical Society, the Chambliss Prize for Undergraduate Research. Right, right. So this is fantastic seeing this, this, this project take off. I mean, three or four years ago, we had no capability to analyze any spectroscopy here at all, and now we've got some of the best people in the country doing this stuff, and students that are learning the technique. It's a difficult technique, but you can get a lot of information out of it. Okay, um, I wanted to mention a few of the outreach events that went on just recently. We had this Venus transit, um, Tabitha, and Kyle have been a number of these things. Here's this Mars landing on August 5th. About 300 people showed up up at the, uh, up at the engineering building at midnight along with, uh, along with a, a bunch of videos and also, the, the, I guess there was people uh, from, from engineering, um, one of our Docents, I guess you call her, teaching assistants, uh, undergraduate teaching assistant that works on the telescopes, uh, South Pacific telescopes. Um, he was up there with the, the Utah robotics team, um, and he, they brought the robots up there as uh, sort of getting people primed to watch the land in here. This Venus transit was fun. There's about 2,000 people that were up in Utah and the National History, and we had a, pretty much the whole astronomy department was up there at different levels of the museum. Um, guiding people through the clouds and talking about what, what the, the Venus transit meant and what we can learn from it. And so that was a big success in collaboration with them. There's, uh, there's, during the uh, annual solar eclipse down in Bryce Canyon, a number of our faculty members went down there, and about 5,000 people showed up and they participated in that. And we ran an eclipse in that South Physics where about 1,000 people showed up to that. This between the two buildings, and that was, that was a lot of fun, too. Um, so those are some of my pictures. Way. Um, so we've been having this great success with getting press coverage and people showing up to this new astronomy event here. Okay, some of the challenges that I see looking forward for us, like I mentioned before, South Physics and Italy, they're in poor shape, this is helping somewhat, but also this, we're limited in space. We really don't have much space to accommodate the growth in astronomy, the MRSEC program itself. If you actually wanted to renovate these buildings and bring them up in shape, there's actually no search space. So search space means a place where we can move into while this is being done. There's no place on our campus to do this. So even if we had the money to do it, where would we need to while that's happening? So I think our biggest problem for us is our individual research group we need to spread out over uh, three buildings. We're in the INFCC building, South Physics and North Physics. And the way I think about this is I call it the defrag problem. You buy a computer and you put the disk is kind of empty and you start putting programs and it winds up all over the disk just because it's convenient. We did the same thing with faculty and students as they started arriving with a growth. You put in whatever room was available. And so we wound up having faculty in one location, 
postdocs in a different location, graduate students in a third location, lab someplace else. And it's hard for them to actually connect and get together. You really want to try to get those groups together and form a coherent group. And so just like your hard drive needs, what we have to defrag, you have to move things around. And so we're going to try to do a little bit of this here. I talked to Ben Bromley, and uh, he's in charge of spaces here, about trying to reorganize some things and talking to faculty members about that as well. Trying to get the theory groups and the together, trying to get the Amway group together, trying to get the, the solid state groups together, and solving that problem. But in the end, we do need more space associated with this. Part of the biggest concern I have is undergraduate lab space. Only about 25% of our engineering and science students are able to enroll in the university physics labs. We are running, uh, you're not like is running those things day and night as much as he can. He's added extra capacity, but we can only run so much. We need more space to be able to put more lab setups up and run them in parallel. And so uh, there's just no space for, for doing this right now. We'd love to have a large engineering tutoring center here for uh, for science and engineering graduate students that are undergraduate students that are going into physics. Very similar to the math tutoring center where people have a central place that they can go and can be staffed by the first year graduate students as part of their teaching assignments. They would be available to help students out and that would help to increase their success in the introductory courses. This doesn't just affect us, this affects all the science and engineering pre-med. About 8,000 students a year would be affected by so it's, it's important that we try to do something to solve these things. Last thing, um, I'd, I'd love to have some large public space for education, public outreach, something where you can have a one to two month exhibition space. I've been bugging uh, the dean about the new Thomas building to have something like this, and it'd be great if we could have something, but uh, if, if the physics department figured out some way to make this happen, that would be great to like, host the summer or review program and then have that be their home for the summer. This was a, a, a little plan that we worked with the architects. This is a defrag problem. The different colors and different groups that are there, and you can see there's this a patchwork of chiclets everywhere. This is one basement for there, by one, one level of the James Fletcher building. But if you look at the other buildings, it's the same way. You have different groups that's intermingled with each other, and it's just sort of done on an emergency basis. And what we'd like to do is redo it so you have one research group here and a separate research group here. And this is all condensed matter experiment, perhaps. Maybe condensed matter theory is on another level. And perhaps some adjacency between them. So if this was one that being Next matter theory, this one to be in high energy theory, there's some place where they overlap a little bit, and over here could be astronomy, and there's some overlap between the common space. The idea, the philosophy we worked with was called adjacency. We're trying to get the people that are supposed to be next to each other, next to each other, and try to try to make a, a, a unified uh, group side of people rather than having to be make it more efficient and make more interactions. This is one of the pictures that they came up with of an idea. The idea would be to put a building between, this is the front of South Physics, when you walk into the graduate student office over here. JFP is over here. And it'd be a very large four-story building, which would actually make both South Physics and uh, JFP one single gigantic building. Some of the things that are in front here is actually access to the roof up here. And so you actually have this nice staircase that walks up. And there's actually going to be more astronomical observatories up there on top as well for education and public outreach. The access, you, you dedicate individual floors to individual research efforts, and you have a large common area where people can meet and you have events in there. So, and some of the ideas about the This is what one of the labs might look like. There's South Physics. There's the same such a building here. So, in the bridge between them, you have a nice lot of light here, places to have a larger number of more technical labs for the undergraduate graduate students, maybe they still kind of longer term basis. So, hopefully, this looks like we can probably double the amount of teaching labs. <laughs> Increasing our core competency in undergraduate and science. So, anyway, this is just uh, stuff I'm not supposed to show you, but I did, so I'll know. <laughs> um, the reason that there's some sensitivity is because this is obviously just uh, uh, somebody's idea, and it may not actually come to fruition that way. But I wanted people to start thinking larger about what we might do here. The uh, upper, we know the upper administration discussed this in May. So, this MJS is a local architects firm. Um, they were very supportive of going forward with this, and we put we probably need about eighty-eight thousand dollars to do a complete physical release. That's what they asked us to go forward with it, and the project won't move forward probably for about a year until that's completed. So we're trying to find some donors, some people that might be able to help out with this. Um, in the long-term plan, this thing would take a uh, it would be a secondary priority to the, the Thomas Building. Thomas Building is the highest priority for 
the department and for the uh, for the uh, college of science and for the university now as well. I believe it's, um, it's probably ranked number one going forward, and uh, that that'll happen first. But following after that, um, a few years after the construction, probably the permits could could move forward. And so we do need somebody to like the spark initiate this process. We're talking to several donors and people. We're talking about administration, but it seems like it's the right time to move forward with this. We've got a lot of you know, groundswell of need here, and it seems like there's a lot of interest in the donor community as well. So hopefully we'll get a good constellation in the next year or so, and then we'll move forward. Um, just some closing comments here. Just add me some of the other things I didn't mention. But uh, some of the things I would like to recognize. Over the last couple of years, we've developed a really strong summer REU program. Last year, we had about 42 students. And uh, Eric Sorte wanted to run the entire program with uh, weekly seminars and outings and things like that. Uh, Chanel Donaldson ran this summer, and it was just a great success. At uh, both years, we had a, uh, a, a capstone end of summer uh, research symposium with both undergraduate and graduate students giving talks. And it was a good a great success and we had a great time there. Um, we've been working with an exchange program with uh, Jazan University, which is in Saudi Arabia. And as part of that initial pilot project, they sent six undergraduate students here during this REU program just to participate in a little bit of culture and learn a little bit about how science is done. They have no tradition of doing science in Saudi Arabia at all. And so it's a big eye of the experience. Then we use some of the machine shops, we use a scanner like on microscope take a trip around some labs and get associated with some of the individual research groups. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss probably about six months from now whether we continue on next year. It was a trial, trial balloon for this thing, trying to see how it's going to work, and uh, we'll see if we continue on with it. But uh, the, the president of John Design University is going to be coming here in November and the Indian Science Society. This is funded by the Saudi Arabian government, and uh, it could have strong benefits for the department and the college as well. Um, growth in Europe, funding on campus. I started about a year and a half ago, two years, doing matching from the department. So if you went and got money from the Europe program on campus to, as a faculty member to fund your undergraduate student, the department would match it one-on-one. -on -one. And it turns out that it's been extremely successful. In fact, I had Steve Rowan's companies asking how we can increase the amount of undergraduate research in other departments. I said the first thing we do is figure out some way to get the upper administration to do this matching or deans that to sign on some kind of matching. I have to be honest, it is the dean's office in the end that's providing this matching. When I became chair, I negotiated for some REU funds. And I said I needed some money every year. And this is what we're using it for. But I think it's actually working out really well to grow our, uh, our, grow our undergraduate research program. That was the intention behind this. Um, one of the things I'd like to do this year, I'm, I'm thinking about how advising those in the department for undergraduates and freshman advising in particular. And I'm really concerned about graduation success. We have a lot of people that register to be a major in the department, but the graduation rates are lower. I'm not exactly understanding why that is. It has to do somewhat with people going on missions and things like that. But I just worry that maybe, maybe we can do a better job of increasing that success rate. Um, so that, this comes out of a perspective. I was just on the East Coast at another university, and they have a better success rate. And the, the way that they mentor the students is different. And they got me thinking about this. I'm talking with a few people in the upper administration about how else it's done on campus if we're different or unique or else maybe there might be something that could be done there. Um, increased education and public outreach has been going on. Uh, we've had a team of has been working on the west side of the city uh, with the Center for Math and Science Education. He's the one that also led the design of the exchange program this summer. And we may be participating in some of that perhaps a a graduate student or so helping out in this project to get a pipeline of students who are underrepresented minorities in the undergraduate population here. I think one of the most uh, interesting opportunities here has to do with the fact that President Dean Persian, he was he's a kind of big defender of the department and he was promoted. And this is a great opportunity for us. He's always given us strong support. He really believes that physics is a great underpinning of all engineering and I think that that can help us out a lot with some of these plans, especially for the building plans. I hope that the state support for STEM education is important. I hope it continues. It seems like it's very strong. I don't know anything about budgets this year. People are worried about a recession, but Utah seems to be okay. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see how that goes. So, I, I suspect the dean will say something about that sometime in the future when he has more information. 
I can sit there at the graduate, the job up for graduate seem to look pretty strong. Um, people are getting hired and getting great jobs, and uh, our, our writers are even in. I hope we can continue that and hope we can uh, get, get students uh, more into the job market and continue to have more success there as well. So this is where uh, we started. Uh, every summer we've had this record growth in enrollment, success in the new faculty, really great awards, great uh, education, public outreach, some great science coming out. But we're getting some more upgrades going. Facilities will survive. We just need to look out for our physical space. And so we really, it's time to think about a new addition. Um, let me close that everybody that I've talked to talking about this new addition has told me it takes 10 years. And I think that might be one of the reluctance why it's been so long for anybody to start the process. Every chair only serves you know, two terms, and I'm at five. This, be my, <laughs> this is my last year, most likely, unless the dean convinces me to stay on. Um, so, uh, so but it usually is longer than a lifetime of a chair. But at some point last year, I decided it didn't matter. And, uh, I'm glad I started to get the ball rolling. And, uh, Next year we'll pick it up if it, if it goes forward, and uh, I, want, I want to see the thing before. It's something that's needed, and if we don't start, there's a there's a there's a saying in Judaism: "If not now, when?" So now, that's when we start, and so that's why we're pushing it so hard. We don't have the money, we have some of the vision, we don't have the support yet, but if we don't start now, it'll never happen. So um, that's why I'm going to try to push forward this year really hard, in making this happen. And I think we have a great chance of making it happen. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to entertain them or comments, please. Everybody's happy. <laughs> Shouldn't you be saying this building's terrible? <laughs> get the torches and get the forks. <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming. Have a good year. And uh, as always, my door is open. If there's anything you want to, you want to uh, need any resources or if you have any problems, please come visit me. Grad students, stick around. <laughs>